rational thought rarely works when it comes to politics and, and, and that sort of thing, or we wouldn't be dealing with many of the issues that we deal with, including these, these irrational and archaic knife laws. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome to the show. Episode number 22, another great one, Bob. We've got for us uh, a, a knife designer, maker, if you will, but also uh, heavily involved in uh, making it better for all of us knife lovers and knife carriers to uh, be able to do so. But before we get to that, we'll tease that just a little bit. Want to uh, remind folks that it would be extremely helpful for you to subscribe to the Knife Chunky podcast. Whatever platform you listen to, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, etc., however you get your podcast, if you just happen to be listening, please subscribe. Got a very easy link for you to do so. You can find the uh, links to subscribe in your favorite app or whatever. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash podcast subscribe. That's all one word, the knifejunkie.com slash podcast subscribe. It would really help us out and ensure that you get the latest episode of the Knife Chunky podcast as soon as it comes out. That's right. That's also important to get these podcasts in a timely manner because of episodes like this one where we speak with Doug Ritter. Doug Ritter is out there. Uh, you know him uh, as the progenitor of the Ritter Grip, but he's also out there fighting for our rights to carry and own certain knives uh, with the Knife Rights Organization. And, uh, you know, if you follow the news at all, you got to got to keep up to date. And he's been plugging away in D.C., making things better for all of us. You want to get this information in a timely manner. Absolutely. As well as uh, lots of other good information and just uh, great interviews that we're having a chance to talk to and a uh, couple of uh, great shows coming up. We'll go ahead and tease that before we dive right into Doug. So uh, coming up now, we'll be speaking with Jeff Blauveld from Tough Knives. Uh, we got Kayla Cummings coming up. We have Jim Skelton coming up. Attention to Detail Mercantile. That's uh, Douglas Esposito coming up. And uh, some more. We got Elijah Isham uh, we're going to be speaking with also. So stick around and, you know, you'll get to hear these podcasts. But make sure you subscribe so they come right to you. Absolutely. The KnifeJunkie.com slash podcast subscribe. Stay tuned. Great interview with Doug coming up next. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? then you're probably a knife junkie. On today's podcast, I'm speaking with survival expert and consultant Doug Ritter. If you've had even a glancing interest in modern folding knives, you've seen his name on the blade of the coveted Ritter Griptilian, a folder of his own design once produced by Benchmade and now enjoying a rebirth with Hogue. What you may not know is that Mr. Ritter has been quietly fighting for our rights as knife owners and enthusiasts as chairman of an organization called Knife Rights, and is in large part responsible for reforming the antiquated knife laws in a growing number of states. Doug, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Happy to be here. Excellent. Well, I would like to uh, get to know a little bit about you, Mr. Ritter, and find out a little bit about Doug, your background. Doug, please. Doug, okay. Tell us about your background in survival training, and how did you come up with, uh, how, how did you become specialized in aviation and marine survival? So at one time in my, uh, my younger years, I was a aviation, uh, writer, uh, writing for aviation publications on a, a number of issues, including writing for aviation consumer and aviation safety. It was there where I started delving deeper, you might say, into the question of aviation survival equipment and that sort of stuff. I built my first aviation related survival kit when i started flying uh myself in the uh early or excuse me in the mid 70s and uh my first article i ever sold as a journalist was about the kit i had built and that was for aviation safety and i soon signed on as a contributing editor when i started reviewing products for aviation consumer uh that resulted in a deeper dive into a lot of the equipment used for survival. And I had started Equipped to Survive, similar time frame, and uh, everything just sort of grew organically as I became better versed in the 
issues involving survival, you know, with, whether you're in an airplane or, or you happen to be out hiking, you know, the survival part is similar. I mean, you end up on the ground and you need to survive until you're rescued or, or get out. So before long, I was talking to groups about survival, thrive, especially survival equipment. And then uh, I started writing for some uh, marine publications and it just, just grew organically. There was certainly no plan. So you were a pilot already. So you had some idea of, uh, what, what was needed and, uh, you know, what, what you would want with you if something bad happened to you while, while flying. So that was kind of your, your jumping off point. That was the catalyst. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when we moved from back east back home to Arizona and I was started flying back here, you know, you fly over Arizona, there's a lot of, of land where no people are. <laughs> and, and you start looking down and going, you know, this isn't like back east. So I developed my own survival kit. Uh, I'd spent a lot of time doing outdoor sports and, uh, camping and hiking when I was younger. So I had some, I had significant background in what it was, ne- what was necessary skill set wise and equipment wise. I'm uh, a pretty good researcher. And that, that's what led to my writing for the publications I wrote about, about equipment and that sort of thing. So. It all sort of just came together. I mean, they, it, at the time that I started Equipped to Survive, there really wasn't any consumer reports for survival gear. You didn't have bloggers and uh, all these other social media outlets. There was no YouTube. Um, you know, this was in the really the infancy of, of the Internet. Um, and I was the only one doing that. Um, I would take articles that I might do for uh, one of the aviation publications where I might have a thousand or 2000 words to work on something. And, you know, on the website, you didn't have those limitations and you co- could go into much deeper depth. Oh, right. And we started doing some groundbreaking work in, uh, for example, uh, the life raft reviews that I did were the first ever done by a consumer publication on the suitability of the various life rafts for, for purpose. And, and the result of that ended up with me being invited to join the SAS-9 Cabin Safety Group, which basically writes all the safety standards for transport category aircraft, so the hmm. airliners and stuff that you fly. It just, it just grew. You know, I, I, I didn't set out to become one of the world's leading experts on survival equipment. It just happened. It just happened. Well, were you always a knife guy, or was that just a part of your kit? I think I got my first knife when I was seven years old. I grew up out on a ranch. Everybody in school had knives. I mean, it was just, you got up in the morning, you put on your pants, you put your knife in your pocket. Back in the day when you went to school with the knife in your pocket. Yeah. Hard for some people to imagine today, but I mean, mm-hmm. whether it didn't matter whether you were male or female, you know, boy or girl, you had a knife in your pocket. And most of our, our teachers did as well. And, you know, I, I camped, I hiked. I always had a, a knife. Uh, obviously, one of the most important tools for survival is a good knife. And so that led to a little deeper dive into what works in knives and uh, started going to shows, getting to know all the people in the knife industry, uh, just becoming more knowledgeable. So my, my, my knowledge base for knives in general was growing. And at the same time, I was getting a lot of requests from people asking you know, what's, what's the right knife? What's the perfect knife? What knife should I buy? And there was, there was often a but at the end of my, my response. Mm-hmm. You know, this knife is great, but it costs a small fortune. Or this knife is great, but it doesn't have a lanyard hold. Or this knife is great, but, and that led me to wanting to develop my own knife. Mm-hmm. When, uh, Benchmade came out with the original Griptilian, mm-hmm. uh, I had, I had known Benchmade for years at that point was friendly with Mel Pardue, who was a designer, mm-hmm. and uh, Les Deasis from Benchmade. And I saw there an opportunity. I loved the axis lock. Um, right. I loved the lightweight. And I proposed that they do a knife with a blade shape, a, a deep, flat grind, um, drop point blade shape that I liked, which was different than they were offering, in a premium steel at that time. S30V, which was uh, a new 
at the time, a, a pretty new high-tech steel. It was certainly the top of the ladder in terms of, of stainless high-tech steels. And they told me I was nuts, basically. Really? That nobody would buy, nobody would buy a premium steel blade in a inexpensive, relatively inexpensive handle, um, for, for a significant upcharge because the seal costs so much. Right. And in the, in the end, they agreed to basically be an OEM and produce the knives for I and my partner at the time. Mm-hmm. And we would buy the knives from Benchmade. And if they didn't sell, it was on us. Right. Well, they certainly sold. That's for sure. They certainly sold, and nowadays um, you can go to any major manufacturer and buy, you know, premium knife steel and a relatively inexpensive handle. So I guess I was right um, <laughs> about uh, the desirability of that combination. You know, people appreciate the ability to afford a premium steel in a handle that, that works but isn't necessarily expensive. So what about the original Griptilian blade? Uh, did you uh, feel needed improvement? Uh, you, the grind on the on the Ritter grip looks much taller and therefore maybe slicier. Uh, what was it about the original blade that that needed improvement in your eyes? I guess it goes back to my first really good knife was a Chris Reeve Sabenza. Mm-hmm. And as as a matter of fact, I I literally saved lunch money for a year and a half to afford to have Chris build me a knife um, in which we engraved the Equip to Survive logo, which was like the second custom engraving uh, that he had ever done. So cool. And I, I carried that knife for years, and I loved the blade shape. Uh, and while I love a hollow ground, ground blade for many things, um, it does give up some strength to a flat grind. You you picked out the, the big difference between the, the standard griptilian drop point or clip point blade and and mine, which is it's very similar in shape to Chris's blade, but it has a very high flat grind and it's as you said slicier. Mm-hmm. And you know if for, from my perspective, you want a pocket knife that slices. I mean that's the reason we have knives. We have knives to cut things. They're not really pry bars. Uh, they're not really <laughs> screwdrivers. Um, they're to slice things. And I want a slicey knife. And it turned out that other people did too. Or, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it right. still today. That was um, 12 going on almost 13 years ago. And people are still buying it. So I guess I did something right. They're incredibly coveted. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a collector's standpoint and from... You know, I make uh, review videos, but my reviews come out of a more of a collector's point of view. And I have really noticed uh, over the last uh, 10 years on YouTube, just an incredible amount of popularity for the Ritter Grip, Ritter Grip, Ritter Grip. No one wants a regular grip. They want the Ritter Grip. Well, I'm not sure nobody wants a, a, a regular grip. <laughs> they they, I, I they don't sell mean a lot like of that. it. I, yeah, exactly. I don't mean it like that. I do mean uh, from a collector's standpoint, someone who's buying the knife uh, to have and to hold and to cherish and to have for a long time, that Ritter Griptilian, you people customize them. They do a lot of great things to them. But now there's a new iteration uh, and you have, uh, well, tell us about the new iteration, the RSK Mark One. When Bench made a couple, two and a half years ago, decided that they didn't want to be OEM basically for anybody. Um, and, and cut us off. It, it was, it was a difficult time because the money we make on the Ritter knives are what allow me the time to do knife rights, uh, which is, you know, a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. So either I had to go get a real job, which probably wouldn't allow me to do knife rights, even if anybody would hire me, or we needed to find a way to, uh, produce a new Ritter knife. And it, it took a while. I had a lot of offers, as you might uh, mm. guess, from a bunch of manufacturers who wanted to do it. But uh, Jim Bruins at Hogue is uh, incredible. The family and the family-run business is incredible. Um, they have a commitment to the kinds of things that I care about. Um, they, they made a strong commitment to knife rights years ago. When they, when they early in, in their knife business, uh, experience and their quality is just 
unbelievable for a production knife. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a good fit. They were committed, as is usual with these things. It took a little bit longer to get it out than everybody would have liked. But, you know, the end result is a second-generation RSK Mark I that addresses some of the things I would have preferred were different on the original Ritter knife. We moved the lanyard hole. We changed the geometry of what we call the able lock a little bit. There are They are subtle changes to the handle and the ergonomics that from, from the feedback we're getting from people, um, we did a pretty good job. On. Um, our biggest problem now is just producing enough of them, uh, which is, which is not the worst problem. That's to a have, good problem to have. The fact that, that it was well received, um, was, uh, was very gratifying. I mean, we'd been out of the market for two years. People were getting crazy prices for the original. Uh, RSK Mark One. I. I mean, just insane prices. You know, three yeah. or four times, and we didn't know for sure what would happen. Uh, what happened is people liked it. Well, I have one on the way. Cool. It's going to be my first Hogue and my first Ritter knife, so uh, I am very much looking forward to it. And next time we speak, I'll I'll tell you what I think about it. But I can tell you already, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. Knives are a very personal thing. When I give when I give talks about survival equipment, you know, I, I tell people if you're buying a knife, it has to fit your hand, and not every knife fits every hand. Mm -hmm. I've been gratified that most people like the ergonomics of my knife, but you know, they they I've certainly run into people who said, you know, this knife feels terrible. Well, then it's not the right knife for you. That's been fairly rare. But it happens. And yeah, and by the way, you're supposed to grip it with your hand. <laughs> I mean, how is that not going to feel good? I find it a naturally ergonomic grip. I've held them. I've never owned one. And, uh, yeah, I, I would I would like to see the hand that that doesn't fit. If you've held the original, which, of course, is a standard griptilian handle, which is very ergonomic, one of the reasons I, I like that, I think you're going to find the new one even better. Um, it's subtly different. But pretty much everyone who holds it was like, okay, this is, this is what it's supposed to feel like, which is a, which is a great feeling not to take anything away from Mel because right. that was an extraordinary design at the time. Our biggest problem is, is, uh, getting production wrapped up to the point where we can keep up with demand and, and then looking at possibilities down the road. So the knife helped you, um, in, uh, your efforts with knife rights. Let's talk about that. Tell me about the genesis of knife rights. And what inspired you to start the organization in the first place? So it's all the Wall Street Journal's fault. And I say that in all seriousness, even even though it sounds a little crazy. In the, in the summer of 2006, the Wall Street Journal ran an article somewhat infamous in knife in the knife community that was on the headline of the B section. And it was all about these evil tactical knives. And it was pretty much written in the same vein as you might read a article about evil assault rifles or something right. like that. Um, it was filled with ridiculously biased language, uh, hyperbole, uh, facts that they apparently pulled out of thin air. It was really a terrible, terrible article. And I waited around for a while for the folks at the American Knife and Tool Institute, which at that time was really the only nationwide organization primarily of members of the knife industry to respond. And they didn't. Um, and I had traveled to Europe. I had spent time in England. Uh, one time I worked for a British car company. So I, I had some inkling of how bad things could get. And this was like a shot over the bow in front of the bow by the same antis who are anti-gun, anti-everything. And I got pissed and decided maybe I should try to do something. I posted on a few few forums that I was active in and said, do you, do you think there's any interest in, in a, a knife owner's version of the NRA, so to speak? And got positive feedback, got a few folks in, in industry and elsewhere to, to pony up a few bucks. Um, and we built a website and sort of waited for all those tens of thousands of people to join up who didn't. <laughs> hmm. Um, 
And then um, in 2009, the Obama administration did us a favor when they tried to redefine what a switchblade was for imports. And a coalition of groups, of which we were the grassroots knife owner part, convinced Congress to add the fifth exemption to the Federal Switchblade Act, exempting one-hand opening and assisted opening knives from being considered switchblades for the purpose of the Federal Switchblade Act. And that was huge for us because that gave us a tremendous amount of credibility. It spread our our name uh, to a much wider audience as we got involved in a national fight at a congressional level. I mean, it's 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 ironic and 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 weird that our very first fight was in Congress. I mean, that's not usually where you start your your advocacy career. <laughs> Uh, as an organization, but it, it, it worked for us. And it was the very next year in 2010 that I hooked up with our director of legislative affairs, uh, which is a fancy name for lobbyists, uh, Todd Rathner. And, and Todd and I have been going great guns ever since. I mean, we, we worked to repeal the first switchblade ban, uh, ever in the country in New Hampshire, passed the nation's first preemption, knife preemption law in, uh, in Arizona. And, um, you know, eight years, nine years later, we're looking at 29 pro knife bills enacted in 21 states and a bunch of anti knife bills. You know, our, our seven and a half year journey so far in uh, federal court uh, against uh, New York City and the New York DA Cyrus Vance Jr. now headed to the Supreme Court, maybe, wow. hopefully. New York City, that's a, that's a big egg to crack. I couldn't find a bigger city in the U.S. to sue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, again, it, you know. from your perspective, switchblades, ballet songs, and and out the fronts and such, they're so maligned in the public view. Uh, is this a backlash from sixty four years Re- Rebel Without a Cause days, West Side Story? What? Why are switchblades? What is so much more dangerous about a switchblade than a, a waved knife that opens as you pull it out of your pocket, or a uh, any other knife? There, there is nothing more dangerous about a switchblade than any other knife. I mean, a fixed blade comes out open. The issue, as you note, goes back to the 1950s, some terrible, often racist-oriented uh, perceptions, courtesy of the uh, of Hollywood and, and the popular press, who uh, found a cause, if you will, as a result of hyperbole and, and just made-up issues from Hollywood. And we ended up with both the 1958 Federal Switchblade Act and, you know, less than, but less than half of the nation with switchblade bands of varying degrees. Um, it was never the majority of states, but we still find ourselves fighting those same prejudices courtesy of the 1950s. We've obviously been very successful big picture wise. I mean, there have been a few setbacks, but we've been very successful big, big picture wise in, in repealing those. I mean, uh, 16 civilian switchblade ban or restriction repeals by us since 2010. Right now, there are only six states left where civilian possession of a switchblade is illegal. Um, we got 33 states with no restrictions whatsoever, 44 allow possession to one degree or another, 29 allow concealed carry. Wow. And 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 16 of those are ones that we've done. So I feel pretty good about having gotten that accomplished along with everything else we've done. Well, you, know, you combine that with with the preemption statutes we've passed that get rid of local restrictions. And, you know, we can't, we came up with a, a, a tagline for knife rights a few years ago that I think sums it all up, which is we're rewriting knife law in America. Well, what is your approach in fighting for our knife rights with politicians when their concerns are of optics and, um, you know, balancing the, the diversity of their constituencies' opinions? We try to approach it very rationally. Todd has a set of... Uh, trainer knives with, you know, no edges or points so he can demonstrate that there's no, you know, practical difference between, uh, an automatic knife and, and any other folding knife and certainly not any advantage over a fixed blade. We're dealing with a, a pretty partisan political situation in most cases in this country, but we have managed to, with almost all our bills, gain, uh, significant bipartisan support. 
uh, not because the two sides necessarily agree, but the two sides for their own reasons desire to get rid of these problems. Um, on, on this, on the conservative side, on the Republican side, you might say you've got, uh, Second Amendment advocates. You've got people who want freedom to carry whatever arm or whatever tool they want. And on the other side of the equation, um, we have criminal justice reform, which appeals to folks whose, whose constituents are often, uh, disproportionately affected by knife arrests and that sort of thing. Um, and that has, that, that's a, a very different political, uh, legislative situation than, uh, the NRA Second Amendment community finds itself with firearms. Um, I mean, we, ha- we have bills where we have the NRA and the ACLU both supporting our bills. Hmm. Um, you just don't, don't find that in many other legislative situations. And it's something we've worked very hard on. Um, and it's one of the reasons for our success in that, you know, we've got something to gain for everybody involved in this. I mean, does it work all the time? No, but it works most of the time. I mean, we, we couldn't get 29 bills passed in, in the few years we've been doing this um, if we weren't getting bipartisan support. So are, are the knife laws that you seek to reform in a static and forgotten state as you come across them, or are they becoming more and more draconian? Are, are people writing new knife laws? Oh, yes. Um, there's about 10 anti-knife bills that we've stopped um, over the last wow. nine years. There are there are a few we weren't successful at, but most of what we're doing is rolling back anti-knife laws that either came out of uh, Civil War era when when many of the Southern tier states were trying to keep uh, daggers and Bowie knives and and that sort of thing out of the hands of of the recently freed uh, blacks. Or they come out of the 1950s where we have the switchblade and gravity knife bands and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so very, very little knife legislation occurred, anti-knife legislation occurred, except for those periods. Not that there wasn't any, but those are the two periods where when we go back and look at the laws that we're repealing, that's that's where they came from. You know, when, when, we, when we repealed the ban on carrying a Bowie knife in Texas in, in 2017, we, when we talked to Texas legislators, they were like, what do you mean you can't carry a Bowie knife in Texas? We're like, <laughs> uh, you know, you go back and look at what happened after the Civil War and you see, oh, well, yeah, we need to fix that. These bans have no rational, no rational basis. Let, let's, let's be real. Millions of Americans use and carry knives every day at, at home, at work, recreation. Every once in a while, they are also used as an arm in self-defense. But mostly we're dealing with tools, tools that are occasionally an arm, but which are overwhelmingly used as tools. Like hammers. Every once in a while, someone will hit someone on the head with one. But on the whole, they're used to put nails into wood. There you go. It's frustrating at times. We've certainly had our setbacks, but uh, we, we just keep plugging away. Texas this season, this will be our fourth session in Texas. Texas legislature only meets every other year, which has its good and bad points. The good point is the legislator, legislation can't get screwed up every year. The bad thing is you can't fix things every year. Tennessee took two years. Kansas took two years. Oklahoma took, it, it's, you know, you, you keep plugging away. One of the secrets of our success is we just don't give up. Politics change. People change. Um, if, if you keep coming at it and you keep working hard at it, you know, most times you're going to, if, 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 if nothing else, you're either going to wear them down or enough things change that they're going to offer you an opportunity. And part of our success is being nimble enough to take care of the opportunities when they offer themselves. So you mentioned a logical approach uh, frequently can garner um, bipartisan uh, support. But what kind of public support does uh, knife rights enjoy just from 
your average Joe? Um, not enough. <laughs> okay. Um, we 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 can always use more financial support. I mean, right. Todd and I both do a hundred thousand miles a year. It is not inexpensive. Wow. But the reason we get things done is is we show up. Most of the people that you're talking to and we're talking to right now are not an issue. They get it. Knives are tools. Yeah. Occasionally used as an arm. We have had uh, surprisingly good luck working with journalists uh, from both the left and the right. When Mother Jones and, and the Washington Post and the New York Times are, you know, running articles that are not particularly bad and actually pretty good in many respects, we're getting our message across just not to enough people. Yeah, I'd say. Well, what kind of pushback do you get? We we get some of the anti-Second Amendment, anti-weapon pushback that uh, you might expect. I mean, we get a degree of that. It's not mm-hmm. unusual for journalists um, from someplace like Mother Jones or, or Vice News who, who start working with us to um, to come in with an attitude or, or presuppositions about what things are. And Todd and I would just try and educate them. And, and generally speaking, that that's worked out. It hasn't always been perfect. But uh, when you compare it with uh, other advocacy situations like guns, um, we've done very well. And I think it's because when it comes down to it, what we're talking about makes a lot of rational sense. There isn't the, the incredible uh, emotional issues involved like there are with firearms. And, you know, a, a lot of folks on both sides of the political divide have pocket knives in their pockets. And, and so when we start talking to people, it's like, yeah, I've carried a pocket knife since I was a kid. I, I wish more kids did these days. Um, that's one of our biggest fears is, uh, you know, to, to great extent, we're losing a generation of kids who are being taught that knives are only weapons and not tools. And the irony is that we all use uh, knives on a daily basis without even thinking about it in our kitchen. And actually, those kitchen knives are the ones that are responsible for the most uses of knives as a weapon. Uh, it, so why not outlaw kitchen knives and let everyone have their switchblades? Well, that's, you're, you're, <laughs> you know, you're that's thinking kind of... somewhat rationally on an irrational subject. And the rational thought rarely works when it comes to politics and, and, and that sort of thing, or we wouldn't be dealing with many of the issues that we deal with, including these, these irrational and archaic knife laws. Well, once, once knife rights, all of your goals are achieved and the states are back to rights with our relationship with knives, will the organization stick around to protect and maintain the gains it's made? <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to run out of of work. I I suspect I will be uh, (laughs) six feet under with still plenty of work to do. Advocacy takes a tremendous amount of time and effort. The nature of it is that, um, you know, we've we've gotten some of the low-hanging fruit now. For the last few years, we've been working on some of the more difficult stuff. It, It becomes easier in the sense that we have this track record that we can talk to politicians about. Look, we fixed this over here, and we fixed it over here, and there was no increase in crime. So how about we fix it in your state? Um, and that's that's a good argument, because, of course, they're always afraid of, oh, if we make switchblades legal, there's going to be blood running in the street and all the rest of this ridiculousness. <laughs> Um, and, and we can show now with a track record going back nine years that that doesn't happen. And right. as you point out, and, and we point out, you know, the most common knife used to commit a violent crime is a kitchen knife. Um, I'd love to be able to have the money to actually have a study done to prove it with statistics. But we just tell people, talk to any of your law enforcement friends, and they're going to confirm that. And they do. I mean, we've had them... You know, we we often get support from law enforcement for our bills who are like, yeah, this is really not a problem. Just cut it or they're neutral on it, which is the same thing from our perspective, because it means, you know, yeah, if you want to pass this bill, law enforcement is doesn't have a problem with that because they recognize that that it's really a non-issue. 
from a from from that perspective. Now, you know, New York City is a is a, a an outlier in that respect, where you know the law enforcement has opposed all our efforts to fix New York City's abuse of their gravity knife laws to arrest tens of thousands of innocent knife owners who are just carrying a common pocket knife. And, and we'll see what happens. Uh, we've got another bill running in, in the legislature, two bills, as a matter of fact, to try to fix it again. Um, we've got our case before the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, we'll probably find out uh, if, if scheduling works out right. We'll probably find out if they take the case um, sometime this summer. And then we'll, we'll go from there. I mean, we think we've got a good case. But so far, the district court and the, and the, and the second circuit haven't really ruled on the actual merits of the case. They've all been dancing around on basically procedural and, and twisting the law to, to avoid the problem. And, and to a certain extent, we're, we're pleased that the second circuit twisted the law so much that they find themselves in conflict with some other circuits, which, which gives us the sort of case that the Supreme Court is often interested, where you have different circuits interpreting their rulings in different ways. But I certainly didn't expect when I started knife rights in 2006 to end up with a case before the Supreme Court. And and if I was going to, and, and, and if, as, as things developed, and I started thinking, well, we might end up with a case between the, before the Supreme Court, I always felt, well, it'd probably be about switchblades and Second Amendment and something like that. Um, but it isn't. Mm-hmm. It's about an, an abusive government in New York City taking advantage of innocent tool owners who are often using their tool at work um, and just happen to have it in their pocket when they're stopped by a cop who might be able to risk flick it open. And disproportionately minority. I know that in New York. It was kind of like they're stopping for over eighty percent. Unreal. I lived there for thirteen years, carried knives all the time, and now I look back it with a retroactive fear. I can't believe I walked around with what I walked around with then. I, I kept myself blissfully ignorant uh, so that I could allow myself to carry to carry my knife. And uh, I've heard a lot of stories since leaving, and as you say, eighty percent minorities. Yeah. Well, that's a great excuse, you know. Um, unfortunately, it is. Um, it's it's why our bills in uh, in the state legislature again have received support from the NRA, the ACLU, the NAACP. I mean, it, it's a problem that you know. And Governor Cuomo has has vetoed those bills twice. Uh, the last bill passed with one nay vote in either house of the legislature. And he still vetoed it. Um, it's, you know, for someone who, who claims to be in favor of criminal justice reform, he certainly isn't acting like that. And, and the arrests go on. Thousands and thousands of people arrested every year in New York City for carrying a common pocket knife. Just as you are blissfully ignorant, you know, 99% of the population in New York City is blissfully ignorant. You know, it's a tool. They can go buy it in a store. They think if they can buy it in a store, it's legal. Um, and it is legal unless you run into a law enforcement officer who can risk flick it open. One of our plaintiffs, having heard about the issue, uh, approached two different cops on two different occasions and asked them whether his knife was legal. Neither one of them were able to risk flick it open. And so they told him, no, this is legal. And then he got stopped by a, a third officer who could risk flick it open. And the next thing you know, he's facing a potential year in jail. What kind of advice can you give people if they are blissfully ignorant and they are um, find themselves at the wrong end of the uh, of the stick when it comes to law enforcement and they just get someone on a bad day and find themselves in jail? What, what are the best uh, simple courses of action they can take to ensure that they don't incriminate themselves further? So on our website at, at kniferights.org, towards the bottom, we have a, a, an article, um, if stopped or arrested, what to do to protect your knife rights. Um, it's written by uh, Evan Knappen, who's one of the leading criminal law attorneys dealing with knife cases. He's author of Knife Laws of the U.S., and it it goes through step by step what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But look, it basically boils down to two things. 
you know, if you're stopped and you're going to be arrested, you need to remain silent. I assert my right to remain silent. And you need to ask for an attorney. I want an attorney. And you may need to do that multiple times. Don't consent to a search. On our membership cards, on the back of our membership cards, are the steps. Remain silent. Ask for an attorney. Do not consent to a search. Always be respectful, polite, and cooperative. Don't physically resist. That will make your lawyer's job so much easier. There's a great video out there that law professor James Duane does. It's called Don't Talk to the Police. I, I recommend that to everyone, knife owner or not. If you're stopped or arrested, if you're smart, you will politely decline to answer any questions other than producing an ID. You don't have to. You shouldn't. Anything you say will be used against you. That is the critical step. And it's why our membership cards include this stuff on the back. Because in the stress of the situation, it's really easy to forget that, how important it is to remain silent. So how can people get that card? How can people get involved and support Knife Rights? They can go to uh, kniferights.org. There are links all over the place to join up. Uh, we welcome new members. They can sign up for our free uh, News Slice uh, newsletter. We'll be having, we'll be launching our Ultimate Steel Spectacular drawing here in about three weeks with any luck. Uh, we'll have $150,000 worth of really cool custom knives, firearms, uh, all kinds of tricked out stuff, uh, that folks can win. Um, at a certain level, they also get an annual membership. Our biggest issue is, is, it's a great opportunity for folks to win really cool stuff. Just getting the word out that it's there. A, a lot of people have, have won at this point, almost, i um, going to say close to $3 million worth of knives and guns and African safaris and stuff like that over the past seven years. Well, you hear that people? Knife rights. Knife rights.org. <laughs> We're the ones getting it done for knife owners. We're forging a sharper future for all of you. Oh, that's good. So I, I don't want to jeopardize any of uh, your current efforts, but I really want to I want to hear some specifics. Would you come back on the Knife Junkie podcast for a roundup of the legislative season once it's over to discuss victories and and the and the rare defeats going Absolutely. on right now? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. I've enjoyed this, and uh, it's a, okay. it's a nice opportunity to talk directly to your people who are my people knife owners who care about knives, who enjoy them, whether they work with them or collect them. This is what we're all about. It's cool. Well, thank you so much, Doug Ritter. I really appreciate your coming on the show and you know, speaking with me and speaking with us about, well, your background, but most especially knife rights. And I think I speak for many, many of us. Uh, we really appreciate the effort you're putting into it. And uh, I know we're all, whether we know it or not, enjoying uh, the knife rights that we're gaining from your efforts. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Thanks for listening to another great interview on the Knife Junkie podcast. Remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial if you go to audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, just go to audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. And Bob, Knife Rights and Doug Ritter, a lot of activity going on across the legislative world uh, right now involving knives. I know from Virginia to Washington State stuff going on, but we specifically did not talk to Doug about that on today's show. Yeah, we didn't want to jeopardize uh, any of the efforts he's uh, putting forth right now. Any little thing right now could could change the tide. So we, we kept away from that. But Doug's going to come back on and uh, do a roundup of the legislative season, talk about his victories and some of the uh, some of the victories that are uh, put off to the future. Let's put it that way. Right. And uh, and he's also going to announce a, uh, a special a special contest for signing up for knife rights and becoming a member of knife rights. And uh, it's an important thing. I think we should all help Doug out because he's uh, at his own expense 
flying out to D.C. on the regular to talk to these people we call uh, that we put in office. And, uh, you know, right. I think he, he deserves our support. Well, that's one of those things I think you take for granted. Yep. You know, uh, you just you, you think you're entitled to carry your pocket knife and, you know, you have certain rights, but kind of quickly learn that some of these things are not to be taken for granted and need to support organizations that are standing up for our rights to uh, carry a pocket knife and carry a knife, et cetera. And, and like Doug indicated, it's much more of a bipartisan uh, effort. People on both sides of the aisle can get behind this because everyone's carried a pocket knife. You know, it's not like the gun issue, which is much more polarizing, in other words. So our fight is one that uh, does have an end in sight, a positive end in sight. So uh, let's all get out there, see if we can support them, and let's get moving. And if you want to uh, go to Knife Rights uh, and get more information, it's uh, simply kniferights.org. That's online, kniferights.org, and you can get more information about that great organization and what they're doing to help us. Another great show in the can, Bob, but more to come. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Final word from you, Bob. Final word. Well, I just heard from Rob Penna. He sent me his new product to test out, and uh, I'll be talking about that real soon. He said I can uh, I can let the cat out of the bag. I'm very excited about it. I have to put it onto my, I'll give you a hint, I have to put it onto my new Recon 1 mm. to test it out, uh, but I can tell I like it already, but but more to, more to come on that. All right, more to come, and I think uh, more videos too. Indeed. And you can find those at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.